Welcome and thank you for joining today's conference review of composting methodology during an avian influenza outbreak. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panels by using the associated icons located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. To submit a written question, select all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box provided and send. All connections are muted at this time. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. With that, I'll turn the call over to Liz Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional Development Services Branch, and I'd also like to welcome you to today's webinar. Our speaker for today's webinar is Mark Hutchinson. Mark is an Extension Professor at the University of Maine and a member of the Maine Compost Team. The Maine Compost Team developed a carcass management program that trains industry personnel, ag service providers, and academic colleagues in the use of compost during routine and catastrophic mortality events. Professor Hutchinson is a USDA APHIS Compost SME and has been deployed during high path avian influenza outbreaks and national disasters, natural disasters to assist with carcass management. Currently, Mark and colleagues are developing carcass management trainings to be held in three high-density animal production areas in the United States. And with that, I'll turn this webinar over to Mark. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here this morning. And as Liz said, we're going to talk a little bit about the compost methodology for even influenza outbreaks. Uh, just a disclaimer at the beginning here, you see a nice picture if you're on the WebEx of some turkeys. Unfortunately, not all the pictures that I'm going to show today uh, will be this pretty. There are some that are graphic, but I think it gets across the points that we're trying to make. So the current, there is a current outbreak, as some of you may know, uh, that occurs in the mid-Atlantic. There's 11 low-path uh, avian influenza premises currently in North Carolina and South Carolina. The detection started in early March. Um, in early April, there was a conversion from the low-path to a high-path uh, premise in South Carolina, um, and those farms are being actively uh, depopulated and disposal methods are going on currently. Prior to that, the, the last outbreak prior to that was in 2017. So it's been a couple years since we've seen this uh, take place, but uh, it is an event that, that we're often we're preparing for. So if, you, if we think about low path and high path avian influenza outbreak and we need the need to um, manage carcasses during these outbreaks, you know, who makes the decision, whether it be compost or other disposal options? And that's decisions on a local level. So it's important to understand that when, when we're dealing with these, who, who are the decision makers? And the ultimate decision is made by the state veterinarian, and usually in consultation with the regional USDA veterinarian service and also the integrators. Uh, in North Carolina, they chose to compost. In South Carolina, they chose to bury. The other thing is if you're looking at these events over time, you also need to understand uh, what the disease is and what type of disease it is. Is it low path or is it high path? How contagious is it? What's the mobility of it? What's the, uh, what's the opportunity for spread um, of this disease? And we also respond to natural disasters. And currently, you know, in the way in, in this time we're looking at herd reduction possible response also. Today we're going to focus on avian influenza and the current outbreaks. There are some guidance documents that I want to share with you uh, for references. The, these are USDA documents. Uh, one on avian influenza. It was written in 2016 after the uh, Iowa, um, the Midwest outbreak of high path avian influenza. There's also a, a live, livestock composting um, document that was written in 2017 that deals with cattle, hogs, can be used for almost any large animal livestock. And one of the documents that I often refer back to is a document written by Dr. Bill Seekins back in 2008 
um, best management practices for large animal compost, carcass composting. This document has a lot of the diff different how-tos and a lot of guidance documents that are currently used in the other two uh, protocols. So when you respond to a high path or low path event, what's the protocol? And if you are following the USDA protocol, this is a 28-day compost process. It's two 14-day cycles. But it is not just 28 days. It's going to take much. It's going to take longer than that to actually build the piles, to construct the windrows, to move the material outside the barns if we're doing inside composting. So, even though we say it's a 28-day compost process, the integrators and the and the producers need to consider time to to actually do the evaluation, to build, and to remove the material at the end of the cycle. There's some minimum requirements as far as temperature goes, so those are things to be considered during the, during the time. It is 131 degrees for three consecutive days is the, the standard that we use, or an alternative is 110 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 consecutive days. This is for pathogen inactivation. One of the things that you'll continue to hear me say when I do talks is that it's not the temperature that's actually killing the pathogens it is the biological activity, and that's really the advantage of using compost, or one of the advantages of using compost during these outbreaks. It's the biological activity. It's the competition between all the different organisms that you'll find in a compost pile or windrow that are competing with the pathogen that we're trying to inactivate. So, even, so the temperature gives us a is a tool to indicate the biological activity within those windrows. So I want to put this up uh, early on in the talk to give you an idea of what, what is our goal at the end of the process. So at the end of 28 days, what, what are we looking for? So this is the, what we call the phase two. This is at the end of the, four, the second 14-day period. What is it that we as an SME or as an integrator need to look at in order for those piles to be approved, to be moved on and say, okay, we've inactivated the virus, we've completed the cycle, and we can move on to C&D. So if you look at it, there's a list of 12, um, really 12 different standards that you're going to look at. It deals with pile height, pile width, the shape, um, whether it's soft tissue, the cover material, moisture content, a lot of different things that we'll talk about today. But I wanted to give you the kind of what we're aiming for so that as we go through the process, you can know what the end goal is. So to me, there's several different steps that you go through when you're dealing with it with an outbreak or when you're asked to respond to an outbreak. Uh, for me, it starts before you actually leave, whether it be your office or your home or wherever. So you need to understand what is the disease that we're dealing with. Um, in this case, it's low path avian influenza or high path avian influenza. So again, how does that disease move from farm to farm? What is the likelihood that you could actually move that far, that disease from a farm the farm as you move, what's that disease? Is it uh, a human pathogen? Is it something that you need to be concerned about? So understanding what the disease is that you're dealing with um, before you leave is, is helpful. Also understanding the USDA protocol. If it's going to be under the USDA APHIS uh, guidelines, then you need to understand those protocols. You know, what is the, the protocols for the first 14 days and the second 14 days? I also like to know what the scale of the outbreak is. Are we dealing with two or three farms, or are we dealing with a couple hundred farms? Because scale makes a difference as far as what resources may be available and how many people you're actually going to need to bring into that particular outbreak. It also brings to the point of the ICS. What is the command system? Is there going to be a central command system? You're going to be under that whole that command structure. Or are you going to be out on your own? In the current outbreak, 
uh, there is a there is a, a very small ICS system, but most of the people that are responding it to it as far as the composting goes are pretty much on their own and have to uh, be able to work independently on these farms to be successful. So now the nuts and bolts of actually reaching onto the farm or once you get to the farm. So first, and I've listed the steps and I'm going to go through each of these steps. So farm assessment, site selection, carbon feedstocks, windrow construction, windrow management, mining documentation, and then troubleshooting, and then finally the recommendations. So I'll go through each of those uh, different aspects of it um, very briefly so that you can uh, get a sense of um, what's going on. So one of the first things when you do a farm assessment and, and response is communication. Communication is key. Communication within the response team itself so who are you communicating with, who's providing the information for you to go to that farm, to respond to that farm, who's getting you some of the background on the um, locations, the properties, the, the birds, the type of birds that they're there. You know, so who's giving you some of that kind of background team, their background information, who are you responding back to or providing the information back to? It's also important when you go to the farm because you, know, you are going to probably be working directly with the farmer, uh, has been my experience, and there's a lot of emotions that go along with losing your flock or having it depopulated. Several weeks ago, uh, Ed Malik did a really nice presentation on um, response and the, the whole emotional, whole uh, psychological pieces of response. And if you haven't seen that, I would encourage you to go back and, and look at that. I believe it's been recorded. So farm assessment. The first thing that you want to do with safety is, is priority for, for everyone, for yourself and for other people going onto the farm. So you're going to do a safety uh, inspection of the farms, and that includes Access that includes the barn structures themselves. That includes going into the barns. Uh, are they are they structurally sound? Is there electrical issues? Are there uh, water issues? Are there ammonia issues? One of the things that we encounter going into these barns, if they've been the birds have been euthanized for a period of time, there's a fair amount of ammonia, particularly if they've been shuttered and, and not open for ventilation. Um, there's a fair amount of ammonia, and you need to be aware of that. These barns generally need to be opened up in order, and vented before you can go on to the, in, in, into the barns and actually start working. There is, uh, so once you've determined your safety uh, aspects of the farm and you feel safe, uh, then you need to start doing the, the assessments of each of the houses on the farm. In this picture, if, you, if you're on the WebEx, you can see the picture. There are four uh, barns or houses on this particular footprint. One of the things that you get caught up into, they all, all the barns look the same on the outside, but it is really important that, that you go into each house and you assess each house independent of each other. Don't assume that the first house that you go into, that everything's going to be the same in houses two, three, and four. The information that you need to collect, you need to collect the number of houses, the size of the houses, what's the width and the length. Uh, that's going to help you in calculating things like litter, the amount of litter that's there, and the amount of footprint that you have to actually build windrows if you're going to do in-house composting. A lot of times you can gather that information from the farmer. The farmer will know the, the construction size and, and length of it. You also need to understand the type of house that you're dealing with. Uh, the ones pictured here are, are, whole, are, are open span barns, but you run into all kinds of different types of housing units for these poultry, the old style pole barns where you've got poles supporting it in the middle of the open span to breeder barns. And we'll talk a little bit more about those as we move through. As you go into the barns and you uh, start your farm assessment, you want to also talk about the number of birds that there are, the size of the birds, and the condition. 
So number of birds, some of these houses are going to have anywhere between 15 to 40,000 birds if they're poultry or if they're turkeys, depending on the on the actual size of the barn. So that matters because you're going to need to do some calculations on volume. The size of the bird will range everything from chicks to to market-sized turkeys, which can be 45 to 50-pound birds. So size matters, and also the condition. You go, have these birds been recently uh, depopulated, uh, or have they been depopulated and because of the size of the outbreak, you didn't get to them for you know, a week, 10 days? Hopefully that's not the case, but the reality is that it does happen. And by that time, birds start to desiccate. There's decomposition that starts to take place. So understanding the condition of the birds is, well, is really important as well. I know that and the other piece of, of actually doing the house assessments is looking at the litter, uh, the depth of litter, uh, and then you have to determine the amount. So if you, you don't necessarily have to take a tape measure with you, uh, most people are pretty good at estimating you know, whether it's six inches or eight inches or 12 inches or 20 inches. So, but you do need to scuff and move away the litter to the bottom of the floor so that you can get an idea of what the average depth is. And then you can do the length of the building by the width of the building by the depth of the litter and come up with a amount of litter that actually needs to be uh, composted as well. Moisture content is is probably the number one thing that you're going to deal with uh, in these outbreaks and in the houses as far as composting goes. Uh, what we find is that there's no rarely do you go into a house where the moisture content is perfect on either end or in the middle. Uh, a lot of times these houses have been depopulated using foam. So the end of the house in which it's been foamed is uh, basically a very soupy mess. Uh, and the other end is relatively dry as far as the litter goes. So there's some, oftentimes you have to start moving litter from wet litter from one end of the house to the other end and you move the drive back to the to the wet end and you kind of have this uh, carousel that goes around and around carrying wet and dry litter so that the moisture content gets equally distributed throughout the house. You don't have one end of the house that's excessively wet and the other end of the house that's excessively dry. So litter is a big uh, consideration and my understanding in this latest outbreak that uh, the litter, this is the third flock through these barns, so the litter was really deep. And when you have that much litter, now you get concerns about whether well, that material is all going to fit inside the house when you start composting. So it's important to get a good handle on the amount of litter. Again, farm safety, I can't stress it enough. There's going to be all kinds of people around in a large outbreak, so that farm safety is not only the farm itself, but you're also your personal safety. So make sure you understand your personal safety and your PPE and how to get in and out. And if you're by yourself here, there's a fair amount of help. But uh, if you're by yourself, you have to understand how to get in and out of your PPE by yourself and do it safely and without moving that pathogen from farm to farm or within your vehicle. Open span houses are, are, are the easiest to use because they have usually have clear spans that you can actually run your equipment in. One of the things that's going to happen is you got to make sure that the water trays, the feed trays, fans are all out of the way so that you can start running equipment to theirs. Uh, that's usually done by the by the farm operator. Uh, we, we encourage our SMEs not to operate equipment on the farm, not to raise waters, not to raise curtains, not to run skid steers, uh, but to make sure that the barn is in a condition that it can actually be operated in. Probably the most difficult uh, facility to work in are the breeder barns, where you have breeder boxes, you have breeder mats, and my apologies for spelling mats incorrectly. But, um, but you've got all the uh, additional issues around feeders and waters and fans and lights. And But in the brooder houses, you also have the boxes, and sometimes there's an uneven floor that you have to deal with. So 
breeder facilities are are the most difficult ones to deal with. And the second most difficult one to deal with are old houses that have poles, uh, which are usually wood structures, and have to move around those poles. This is a farm assessment sheet that uh, we use during the uh, flood situation in 2018 in North Carolina. Uh, but it's a really good uh, tool to take onto the farm with you so that you start collecting all the information from that uh, farm that you need. It is, uh, it gives you the farm name and then it gives you who the contact person is because the contact person may not actually be the farm owner, it may be one of the integrators or someone from the integrator company. Uh, and then, you know, how, how is it going to be, how, what's the disposal method? But then down below, even more importantly, it, it starts talking about the number of houses, the species, and then you can start doing your calculations uh, through that whole process for each of those different species. And if it's a specific outbreak like it was this time for for turkeys, you can modify this spreadsheet and just have turkeys and eliminate, you know, the poultry, the finishing, the sows, and so on. Uh, but the, the other part that this does when the, this is actually developed is that this goes back to a central command center, uh, and if other people are also working on that farm, they can look at this farm assessment and don't have to redo the work, but it, it, it builds continuity into what the farm assessment actually was, and it helps the planners start to develop uh, things like how much carbon do I need, how fast do I need to get it there, how much, how, many, how much equipment do I need at that farm or that facility. So it really starts to be your planning tool for everything else that follows along. So as you do your farm assessment, one of the other things that we oftentimes don't think about our other materials on the farm. So one of the things, if it is a disease outbreak, uh, you would need to also consider all of the feed that is on the farm and in the bins. So that feed needs to be composted as well and, and managed. So there are times on farms to where those bins were just recently filled and there's a tremendous amount of feed that takes place and you have to incorporate that into the compost uh, windrow. Other times the bins are relatively empty and it, it, it's not a, as big a deal, but it can be a significant amount of feed that goes through that uh, composting process. Birds and litter, of course, and then there's also outside concerns. Uh, a lot of these facilities have litter sheds and if birds had been, deads had been recently put in there or litter had recently been removed at some point in time, that litter in the litter shed may also have to be uh, dealt with, particularly on high path avian influenza outbreaks. Uh, we had to deal with um, litter sheds as well. And that material, there are issues that that's a special circumstances. Sometimes they, we can do the compost and write in those litter sheds if they're not tremendously full, uh, but sometimes you have to find space outside uh, land in order to compost those layers. Rarely do we bring that material back into the barn or into the houses. So that brings us to the compost site selection. So how, how do you assess what's going on in the house and how can you actually work if you're deciding to work in the house on composting? Is it going to be a single windrow or is it going to be a double windrow? The picture you see on the right in the upper right is a double windrow. Uh, the barn was wide enough and tall enough that we could run, out, run equipment in there to form a double windrow. But sometimes there's only enough room for a single windrow and that windrow becomes quite wide and, and quite tall. Uh, so you have to figure out the amount of material that you have, the amount of space that you have, the type of barn that you have, all plays into how do you actually compost within the house. If there's no room in the house, uh, and there are occasions where it, the material is just not going to fit in the house, there are allowances for outside composting, which is rare, 
but you must get either the state veterinarian's approval or if it's a USDA outbreak, you're probably going to have some conversations with the, the incident command team and get approval to go outside. And we'll, one of the issues with a lot of these farms is land availability on the farm or on that footprint. There just isn't space on that farm or the, the owner of the barns don't, doesn't necessarily own the land in proximity to the farm. So there's a lot of issues with going outside, not only with the potential for the virus to spread because this is an aerosol, it can be an aerosolized virus, uh, but also about land availability and access. The other thing about outside, if you look at this picture, I, I blew it up for you, is that uh, you have to find a spot that actually works. This site was not the most ideal site, but if you look at the barn to the right and you look at the cornfield left, the spot that they're actually building the windrow on is the only spot the owner owned uh, besides the barn. They did not own that cornfield, which would have been ideal, but again, you've got corn that's, you know, Fairly, fairly far along at that point in time, you need to lose that crop. But there's issues with siting this here as well. And so you've got slope coming off from the ground and you've got the tremendous amount of water that may be coming off the roof into that uh, compost site uh, if there's a significant rain event. So yeah, you may have to do some site modifications or uh, windrow construction modifications in order for this to work. Here we here they just built a base that was uh, significantly deeper than what you would normally want in a or have in a compost pile. So siting is siting is uh, something that takes some time to think about and to process through. So once you start thinking about siting, now you got to think about carbon feedstocks and. A lot of these pictures are outside pictures, not inside, because they actually it's easy to get clarity outside. So for teaching purposes, so um, that's why you'll see some pictures now outside uh, rather than inside. So you have to determine the amount of carbon, and this is a a task that uh, is calculated, and there's there's good data on how much carbon is actually used. You can either do it by volume or by weight. I prefer to do it by volume, uh, but many people prefer to do it by weight. Um, I prefer by volume because if you're talking about a pound of carbon, the moisture content uh, of that carbon material comes into play in the weight, where if you're dealing with cubic yards, the, the moisture content is not uh, factored in, into the, to the volume of that material. So I do it generally by volume in order to uh, not be concerned about the, the water content of the or the moisture content of the carbon. So that carbon needs to be a, uh, there are different types of carbon out there that, but they need to be basically dry, uh, high, uh, high density type carbon that can absorb moisture. Uh, you're going to have a fair amount of moisture coming out of those birds. The birds are, you know, 80 to 85 percent moisture. You know, when they're mature, uh, there's going to be a, a fair amount of moisture that comes out of those birds that needs to be absorbed. You don't want to have leachate, so you want to have uh, dry carbon uh, that can absorb that moisture. On the other hand, thinking about the way in which compost piles work, you also need carbon that allows air to flow to move through it. So you may be looking for a variety of different types of carbon based on particle size. Everything from shavings, wood shavings to wood chips, which are not the same. Uh, so, so it's a matter of, of, the, of understanding what materials go on the base and which materials can be used for a cover material. The type of carbons that you're going to use is, is really, you have to ask yourself, what is available regionally. Uh, you know, here in the Northeast, we use a lot of wood products, but in the Midwest, or um, you may use things like corn stover. So ask yourself what is available regionally. And I 
a little bit off track, but I try to encourage states and integrators to start thinking about this well before there's an event that takes place. You know, where 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 can I source car carbon? What types of carbon can I source if we were to be hit with some type of zoonotic disease and we had to depopulate large numbers? Spent a lot of time thinking about characteristics of carbons, you know, but moisture and particle size are really the two most critical parts for the base, and you can see the base on the right-hand side. It's, it's the, the base is made out of a coarse chip material, and then there's a layer of shavings, and that's your absorption material. The base is to allow the airflow to move through, and then you've got, we use a hot compost mix on the top above the birds, uh, but it doesn't have to be, it could, it could again be a mix of that, of the shavings or corn stover or something that allows the, that carbon or the material to actually absorb the odors that may be coming out of that pile. So wind, co wind road construction, uh, you know, how, how does it actually work? And I'm going to talk mainly about it being an in-house uh, response because that's what we're currently doing in North Carolina. <clears throat> so in a ideal world, you would clear the center alley. So you're going to uh, think about that there's going to be birds equally distributed or relatively equally distributed uh, throughout the length of the house. You need to make a center alley that will allow you to start building the base of that compost windrow. So you Take a skid steer or a front end loader if the if the open span is big enough, and you can start pushing litter and birds to the outside. Uh, you kind of start blending the litter and the birds together at that point in time. So that's really your first type of mixing that takes place, and you're also blending some of the moisture at that point in time, trying to get the moisture equally distributed throughout the house. Once you've cleared the center alley, then you're going to start laying a a base layer. That material wants to be a mixture of coarse material with some fines. Uh, the coarse material again is to allow the airflow through the through the base and up to the core of the pile. But you also want those fines to absorb the liquid that's going to be possibly released from the from the birds. That base wants to be 10 to 15 inches deep. Uh, again, depending on the moisture content of the birds and the moisture content of the litter and if there's been depopulation taking place by foaming. Um, drier houses, you can get away with less base. Wet houses, you need more base. So it's a, a matter of, again, assessing that what each house is. And it, again, one through four is going to be, you may have 10 inches in one house and 15 inches in a second house all on the same premise. No wider than 12 to 15 feet. Uh, it's a total uh, width of the base and no higher, eventually your pile is going to be higher than six to eight feet tall. And the reason for this is, <clears throat> excuse me, is for, again, the, the way in which the pile functions, you need to be able to draw air through the base and out through the, the top or what we call the chimney of the windrow. If you get wider than 15 feet, then we really struggle to actually force air or be able to naturally draw air across that width up through the base and up to the top. Once the base is laid out and it's uh, appropriate, you're going to start laying birds on on the base, and you're also going to mix in litter and the feed and any other organic material that might have been on the farm. Uh, <clears throat> We dealt with the egg laying out laying operations in the Midwest where we had to do all the cartons and plastic or all the cardboard as well. So, so it really depends on what the operation is and what's what you need to deal with. But it all needs to go inside in what we call the core of the pile. This is where all the infected uh, material on the farm ends up. Once you have that infected material uh, in the core. Then you're going to put an 8 to 12 inch cap uh, of material over the top, and that cap is needs to be clean, non-infected material. Uh, a lot of people want to use the dry litter as a cap, 
but because it's been infected, it cannot be used in CAP in a disease outbreak. It may be different if it's a non-disease outbreak and, you know, we're in a situation where that may actually come to play if we have to um, euthanize some of the or depopulate some of the poultry houses because of, of the processing issues that are going on. But in this situation, it needs to be an 8 to 12 inch, uh, inches of clean cap material, uh, again, carbon, something that can um, absorb odors and absorb uh, some of the moisture that actually may uh, leak through the sides of the pile. You can see in a picture, uh, you can see the base, you can see the cap, you can see that the cap actually doesn't go over the edges of the base. You want to make that the core and the cap just basically come to the edge of the base so that the base doesn't get covered in the cap material uh, and that it can actually function the way it's supposed to function, allow the air to move through. I also put on the picture that it, that shape matters. So that trapezoid shape matters, that you need to have a, you, you like to have a sharp as peak as possible. Again, that that works because the way that that's important because of the way in which the pile works, it is a, a it, think about it like a chimney in a fireplace that the higher the, the chimney, the more draw you get. So the better the peak on these windrows, the better the draw of the air coming out from the base out to the top. If somehow you get a flat top and that flat top uh, does not have the draw that a that a pointed uh, windrow pile will actually have. So shape matters. <clears throat> so I set up a set of pictures, and those of you on the phone, I'm sorry you can't see it, but if you start clockwise at about 11 o'clock, uh, you can see the birds are, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the birds are pretty well equally distributed throughout the house. They just basically died, and you know wherever they died or, or depopulated, is where they ended up. The next picture to the right at noon, it shows that uh, the skid steers in there are starting to clear the center alley and we're starting to move stuff to either side of the barn uh, and be able to start laying the base. Picture on the right, even though it's outside, uh, I really wanted to show what that material looks like when it starts going back onto the to the base. It's, it's that blend of birds and litter uh, and equally distributed. You do not want to have, you know, groups of birds, you know, a, a, a bucket full of birds and then a bucket full of, of litter or feed. You want that kind of be blended because it's the, the biological activity is going to take place in all that and they, in each different component that you put in there provides different, uh, feed, feed to the biological microbes and it, it's in, in moisture. So the birds distribute the moisture to the feed and to the litter in order for that biological activity to happen. So if you just have groups of birds and groups of litter, uh, it does not function well. The next picture down shows that the, the kind of the forming, initial forming of the center or the windrows in this particular barn. Again, it had two windrows that needed to be capped. The, the picture is okay, but I, I the SME, I believe, came back uh, to this group and said, you know, th these piles really need to be shaped. You can see that they're kind of flat, they're kind of wide, they're they're not uniformed, uh, they're not going to function well uniformly throughout the barn, so you're going to get uh, inactivation that's not consistent throughout the, the, the house. The picture at 9 o'clock, you can see, uh, you know, there's two windrows, you know, that that's a great job but by that uh, contractor and that's that SME, you've got a really good cover. You don't see any tissue hanging out. You don't see any uh, uh, litter. It's, it's well capped. You can see the base material, uh, and, and it's just a, the size is appropriate, so it's it's been really well done. And that's really the goal of what you're looking at. If you want a model of what you want in these houses, that slide is really the the, the model. Want to talk a little bit about function of the compost pile uh, again, just so that people understand uh, why can't we put it up against the wall, or why do you keep the spacing that you have? Again, it's because the air comes out through the side, uh, the base of the pile, and it goes out to the top. 
Uh, in this picture, you see some dry, the, the white areas on the outside of the piles. These are the air, what are called the air intake uh, areas. The air is actually moving through those areas because it's the path of leach resistance. It's going into the core, and this is, this picture actually had you know 450, 500 chickens in it, uh, and then the air is actually coming off the top, and you can see the steam coming off the top. So understanding the way in which these piles work is really important to to convey to people so that they can actually build the piles uh, so that they're efficient. So the process, uh, it's a 14-day, once those, once that windrow is completed in the house, it's a 14-day process where you start to monitor temperatures. You would flag those windrows in 10 different locations, uh, 10 locations, and really, uh, I think we've come to the decision that it doesn't matter whether it's 50 feet or 500 feet, it's still 10 locations, uh, and the SME, when they come back and check, should do some random checks beyond those 10 locations just to make sure that there's no really kind of crazy spots or something that looks odd. Um, but you're going to monitor the temperatures for, for those 14 days, and you need to, to reach 131 degrees for three consecutive days at both the 18-inch uh, check and also the 36-inch or the core of the pile. So you take temperatures actually at two locations within the pile, and that's Again, understanding the functioning of how the compost piles work, uh, you'll see the temperatures on the 18-inch rise first, followed by the core of the pile in a couple of days, and then over a period of time, those temperatures will actually invert where the core will be hotter than the 18 inches. And if you see that, that means that your functioning of the pile is, is functioning well. The 110 degrees for 10 consecutive days, uh, is also a way to inactivate the virus to biological activity and, and can be used as the standard to actually move that on to the next stage. As you manage these windrows, one of the things that will happen is you'll get, uh, you, you want to monitor them for vector activity. The, the most common in an in-house is looking for fly activity where you may not have gotten uh, some tissue completely covered. So you'll start seeing flies uh, uh, along the surface of it. If you start seeing flies, that, that's an indication that there's soft tissue or blood nearby uh, or even perhaps some feed, uh, but usually it's soft tissue and you need to do some remediation and that usually means just having some additional cover material or cap material there to cover those spots up and to uh, make sure that they are uh, buried with that. 10 to 12 inches of cap material. The other thing that happens, particularly with big birds uh, and with livestock, is you get what I call the windrow, windrow slump. So after two or three days, if these birds have uh, were um, birds like you would normally see, that you know the, the body mass was still there, they hadn't desiccated because of time. Uh, the windrow is actually going to get a slump in the top, and it's going to cave at the top of that peak. And it, it's really important to, to recognize that. Uh, this, this, this is an area where they start cracking, and you can start getting odors being discharged from it. And it's important that you go back just with a hand rake and, and fill in some of those slump uh, areas in order to, uh, to reshape it and to get it back. And this usually happens two to three days after the piles are formed. Uh, they start seeing those slumps if it's going to happen. The other thing is you monitor during those 14 days, you're going to look for leachate. You know, the, are the piles leaking? Uh, you know, what is the source of that leachate and how are you going to manage it? If it's just a, you know, uh, one spot that's leaking, uh, you can put some dry carbon material down. You can absorb that leachate and then put it back in the pile and cover it. Uh, if it's a if it's the entire pile, then you may need to reconsider about the construction of the that pile and and do some remediation on it. What we have to remember is that you know there's really two goals during this process. One is to inactivate the virus, and the ultimate goal is to to get the grower back into production. So if we have to go back in and reset these piles, that 14-day clock restarts. And that's, uh, that's a, a fairly significant delay for getting back into production. 
and we tried to avoid that at, at, if at all possible. Um, so if everything's uh, approved and has been looks good on the pile, they met their temperatures, they, there's no vector activity, there's no leachate, um, those piles are turned at the end of 14 days and then the flags are reset and moved on. Into the second day, into the second set, so uh, troubleshooting the piles is, is uh, I've already talked about that, but remember that temperatures is the biological uh, indicator of biological activity, and that's really what's doing the inactivation of the virus, so you really want to pay attention to the temperatures, and then moisture and vectors are, are key. Here's an outside pile that I dealt with. You know, this is just a, a, a pile that was built. It was way too big. Uh, it was 14 feet wide. It was, you know, 9 to 10 feet tall. It had birds showing, you know, and they were already into this process for about uh, eight days. And you can see they put the base on, but the base also had a lot of birds in it. So it, uh, it was a nightmare, and, and they actually had to go in and restart. Uh, even though this is a layer operation, so it's a little bit different, but it's, uh, they had to restart and they, it, it took a long time to get through this process. So it's best to do it right the first time. The second cycle is, uh, again, uh, monitor temperatures. Again, it's, it's at 131 degrees. And once you've met that and there's no issues and, you know, things are looking good in the process, uh, at the end of that 28 days, there's an approval process. But once that approval has been completed, they can then start to move this material outside of the house, uh, either onto their own farmland, uh, on the, their own footprint there, or with permission, they can actually start moving it to other regions. But if they move it, they, they need to actually have uh, approval to, to move it off-site. So that's a really important part. If they anticipate moving that off, I try to get our, the growers to actually think about this when we first started, you know, where is this end product going to go at the end of the 28-day cycle, and do we need to start that approval process prior to that uh, completion of the second 14 days? So, oh, um, I'm not sure if this is going to work because of the way it works. Nope. Uh, oops. So uh, I got actually if I could click on that slide, I'm not sure if Liz or someone can click on that to to get uh, the previous slide, but it, it it's it's two pictures in one, and I just overlapped them. Um, but anyways, the, this is the recommendation at the end of the of the uh, 28 days. This is the same picture that you can't see that happened in the first. It's the 12 checklist. And at the bottom it says IS and SME approved these files, they've met all the standards and, and go on. What you have to remember is that the SME uh, or the person actually um, working these files is not the one to actually clear these files and to approve these files. You're just making a recommendation that they get approved. They need to be approved either by the incident commander or his designator or the state vet or their their designee uh, as an SME, we do not uh, do the final approval on these piles. So it, it's, a, it's a recommendation, not, a, not an approval. There are also options for not approving these, and there's a whole list of standards that, you know, they didn't meet the right size, they had vector issues, they had leachate issues, and you can actually reject those and, and make them go back to the process. But that's a, that's a really difficult uh, decision to make, and it should not be made solely by the SME. It needs to be made in consultation with the whole team, in my opinion. So at the end of the day, you know, you're, you know, we're going to come through any disease outbreak. We're going it, to, it's a process. It's a, it's heart wrenching sometimes, but you know, things are good at the end. Uh, this, this is the view from my office most days when I'm working in my office. So, um, you know, I get to enjoy life. So at that point in time, I think we're about 10 minutes uh, before the hour, and, and I'm, I think we can open it up for questions.
Great. We do have a question in the chat box. It says, when you turn the windrow after 14 days, do you have to create another carbon-based layer for airflow? So the, our experience has been no, uh, that there's, that this material at this point in time has a, has usually has enough um, uh, bulking material in it that it's going to actually have uh, be able to just be turned and go. Most of the time we don't have room to add any more carbon into it, and nor do we want the expense of adding it in either. So it's, it's, uh, it usually works pretty well. And blending, and blending the base material in with the rest of the material, you get that really nice pile structure and allows the airflow into the whole pump. Okay, we do have a comment. It's a great presentation. Um, we did have a request to see if they could get a copy of the slide set. You and I can talk about that offline. Um, someone else wrote in, that's your view for like four weeks of the year. <laughs> Let's see the frozen lake view that you see that other 11 months. <laughs> this, this is actually this is actually Penobscot Bay, so it's the ocean, so it doesn't actually freeze. It doesn't freeze. There you go. Yeah. Very informative presentation. Who within USDA can make the assessment and approvals you mentioned? So the the assessment the assessment is usually done by an SME, but the approval is usually done by either like the either the incident commander on site or their designated or. Uh, the state vet or their designee, and it is uh, usually there's, con you know, I, we talked about communication right at the beginning. It, it, there's communication in, between the SMEs and the designee that's going to do the approval, so it, it should not be any surprise at the end of 28 days if these piles are to be rejected. That, that issue should have been discussed weeks before and those issues resolved before that 28 days. So once you hit the 28 days or even the 14 days, you know, you should be, and that approval and that paper being filled out, it should be approved, but it's, uh, communication is really key. The next question is what specific training or designation is needed for these responders? So. In order to be a, what's called a USDA compost subject matter expert, there are three parts that, and then I'll ask Lori to jump in here if I miss something, but they need to take a program that's, a course that's approved by USDA that deals with carcass management, uh, and, we, and then they need to pass an exam from that course with at least 70%, uh, and then they need at least two weeks of training, field training with a subject matter expert, a current subject matter expert on some type of disease response outbreak. I'll make a plug. Okay. Currently, currently the only the only program that I'm aware of is actually the one that, that the University of Maine runs. Thank you so much, Mark, and, and for such a great presentation. And, and this is Lori, and I just wanted to, you know, clarify the last point. So if a, a person takes a course, uh, passes a test, the two weeks of hands-on training don't necessarily have to be in a disease response. It could be natural disaster or something along those lines. Um, you know, we've uh, had a hard time getting people into those rotations where they can get the two weeks of experience unless they're in a state that gets lots of natural disasters. Uh, so we're continually working to improve that, that program. Thank you. The next question is, knowing that indoor composting is better, can you comment on plastic tubes or bags for large volume of animal carcasses for outdoor composting? So we've looked at those, you know, they're called ag bags or solid bags. Uh, the, the problem with that is trying to, this is an aerobic process, so trying to get air into those bags uh, is, is difficult. Uh, they are, they oftentimes go anaerobic, and when we use them for making silage, that's an anaerobic process. So by nature, they just, they don't have the same ability to do the mechanism of getting airflow into those bags like you do uh, without them. The plastic sides, you know, how do you get air to it, I guess is the question. 
and where we struggle. And people have tried to put forced air into it. They've tried to uh, a variety of different things, and they just don't seem to to function well. You end up with this wet mess uh, because you, part of the process of composting, you you lose the carbon dioxide and you also lose the moisture. And in a ag bag, you don't lose either as a rule. The next question is, would you add a cap for the second 14 days? So adding a cap on the second 14 days depends on the if there is still soft tissue present or if there's still infected tissue that comes to the surface, the, there could be a, a second cap that needs to be added. Uh, that cap usually is a much uh, less in volume. It's usually you know four or five inches, probably half of what we did in the first cap. Uh, so there is a possibility that that may happen. Uh, most of the time, that at the end of 14 days, we're we're not seeing a lot of soft tissue. So it, it, you need to evaluate each barn and, and how that process goes along. Um, the bigger the birds, the more likely are you, that you need to add cap. How deep are the birds in feed, et cetera, on the pile? Uh, good question. So, the, you know, you're going you're gonna to make your piles, you know, around six to eight feet tall. You've got, uh, you know, 18 inches of base. So, and then you've got about 12 to 15 inches of cap on the outside. So you've got basically two to three feet of carbon material uh, encapsulating it. So you've got three to, you know, five feet of material inside. Um, usually it's somewhere around four feet, I would say, inside the core. Uh, again, you, it's not going to be four feet of just birds. It's going to be four feet of that blend of birds, feeds, and and litter. Okay. What considerations are necessary in an area with strict groundwater regulations? So if the piles are constructed appropriately and correctly, there should be no concerns about groundwater because there will be no leachate. Uh, that that leachate, the material coming out of the birds, will be absorbed into the carbon base, and that's why the carbon base needs to be uh, of the appropriate um, depth and of the appropriate carbon, dry carbon material. So uh, there are there should be no concerns about groundwater uh, if, if the piles are built appropriately. The next question is, what are some examples of where end product after 28 days goes? Does it go to the landfill or does it stay on site? So at the end of 28 days, the, the, you know, to me, uh, I'm an agronomist by training, and this, this is a valuable product. So this material, in, in, in that sense, becomes a soil amendment. So they can directly land apply it uh, onto agricultural crops. Um, in North Carolina, I know that they, they allow that to be put on a crop that's going to be growing within, I think it's either 30 days or 60 days. You'd have to check with the guys at North Carolina. Joe Hedencia could probably answer that for you. But um, but you can direct, directly field apply it. To me, to, to compost it and then send it to a landfill is just, it, why not just do it initially, take them to landfill? if you're going to take the compost to the landfill. It's a, it's a valuable product. Okay, how do other positive facilities at different stages of response surrounding the facility affect the approval of a compost pile? Uh, it, uh, to my knowledge, and I'll maybe defer to Lori, but I don't, I think each individual premise is uh, judged on its own merit. So uh, I, I, I don't think that the farm, a positive farm next to it, affects the farm that may go through, be going through the approval process. Is that fair, Lori? Uh, I, I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question? So the question was, how does the how does a positive farm next to one that's going through approval affect that approval process? Uh, so if it's still uh, in a control zone, then even if that one that's, you know, further ahead 
even if it could be released from quarantine, it's still going to be in a control zone. So there would still be restrictions on moving materials um, on and off that farm. They would have to be done under permit. So it, it would have an effect. But that, but the material on the farm that's ahead still could go through the approval process, correct? And yes, and it could be permitted. And so it could be permitted off-site as a, um, a commodity that's not infected. Okay. We have another question. Um, this question says, you reference biological activity multiple times. Can you go further into what types of bacteria are involved in that activity? Oh, there, there are thousands of, of different types of bacteria and, uh, and fungi that actually work in a compost pile. And, you know, I'm not a microbiologist. I, I haven't studied that piece of it. But uh, I do know that there are the, the, the piece that, that always intrigued me with the competition piece, that these different microorganisms, because of the compost activity, are, are fighting for resources from food to water to, to oxygen, and that there, and there are bacteria out there that are actually feeding on some of these pathogens. Unfortunately, I don't know the specific um, microbiology behind which organisms they are. The other question, the next question is, are there regional differences in that activity and how do seasonal temperatures affect the activity? So the, the regionality really comes into play, in my mind, is, is based on what carbon feedstocks might be available. Uh, one of the things that when we're doing trainings and we're, we're trying to set up some trainings now regionally is to, to understand what carbon sources are available recently and how those carbon sources actually work. So that's why I think planning ahead of time for a lot of these integrators is really important to understand what's available and how, how that actually works. To me, that's the biggest regionality. I don't, I don't think there's a, 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 a turkey barn in Iowa is the same as a turkey barn in, in North Carolina or in Indiana or Minnesota. You know, they're all pretty much laid out the same way. Uh, the, the difference becomes regionally too is, is how the state, each state has a different perspective on disposal methods. Some are really into the, uh, you know, want to use the, the composting and some of them are like, we're not going to go down that road, we're going to bury or landfill. So those are some regional differences on, on, on philosophical reasons uh, or, or issues. Uh, and seasonal temperatures, uh, if you're composting in in house, the seasonal temperatures are are not nearly as uh, important as they would be if you're outside. If you're outside, you know, and you're in Minnesota in February, you know, it, it's a little bit more difficult to get a pile started, uh, and you would start looking for uh, materials that heat quickly and have a lot of energy in it in order to get that pile. But it's not it's not an insurmountable hurdle to do that year round. We have one last question in the chat. Is it necessary to cover the pile with a membrane in case of outside composting? So when you start covering with, you know, plastics or or some type of non-permeable membrane, you start restricting airflow, and that's the airflow and that uh, oxygenating that pile is really important. So covering the pile outside is really uh, detrimental to the to the composting process. They do actually make something called a compost fleece. Um, it, it helps shed water, and, it, and it's a breathable cloth, but it's also quite expensive, and, and in my opinion, it's not something that's necessary. Uh, most of the compost piles, again, they're shaped, they're shaped in that pyramid shape, um, and people say, well, won't they absorb water? The, the reality is, and Mark King's done some work on this in Maine uh, on how these piles actually shed water. Uh, most of the water that, or most of the rainwater or snow that lands on a compost pile is actually shed and doesn't actually penetrate into the compost material. Okay, well, we're up past the hour, um, and I don't see any other questions in the chat, and I don't see any questions in the verbal queue. Oh, wait, we have one more in the chat. 
is a plastic liner recommended to put underneath the pile to prevent leachate into the soil? So the, the answer to that is no. Uh, we don't we don't recommend any type of modification uh, for most sites uh, if they're appropriately uh, sited. Uh, if if we were concerned about leachate or if we we're concerned about groundwater, we may build a base a little bit deeper and a little bit um, with more fines in it to to make sure that we prevent that leachate from going into it. But again. Properly constructed compost piles, the leachate is going to be absorbed in the base and not actually come out of the piles. And that's one of the things that, that we look at uh, when we do the evaluation of the compost piles uh, and monitoring is that, you know, is there leachate? And if there's leachate, it means that there is, you know, some issues with the construction process. Okay. Well, with that, um, I'd like to thank everybody for their participation today. And on behalf of the National Training and Exercise Program, I'd like to thank you, Mark, for the presentation. Um, and also thanks to everyone who attended. The National Training and Exercise Program will be offering two webinars in May. Please watch for your email. And if you have any ideas for webinars that the VSNTEP can explore um, for our emergency preparedness community, please feel free to contact us. Um, you can find other webinars on many other topics on the TEP video gallery online on the USDA APHIS website. And with that, I will say have a great afternoon. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T event services. You may now disconnect.